February the 20th uh, meeting 2020 of the Johnson City Board of Commissioners to order. Welcome everyone who's here in the chambers visiting with us tonight on a cold and snowy night. Thank y'all for coming. Uh, for those who are watching on TV and those who are live streaming the meeting tonight, we welcome you to your meeting. To our meeting, um, this is your commission at work tonight. Uh, tonight we will have our invocation by Pastor Will Easler of the Grace Meadows Church. And if we could all rise and remain standing while we do the Pledge of Allegiance. Pastor, thank you. God, we, uh, we thank you for this time tonight and thank you for this opportunity. God, we pray tonight that you would uh, just bless this meeting tonight. God, that you would have your hand upon it. God, that you would have your hand upon this city. And God, we're just thankful that we get the opportunity to live in this great uh, corner of this country. And God, I just ask that your hand will be upon these leaders as they make decisions and as they uh, just do uh, city business. God, that things would uh, move quickly and, and, and business would get done. And uh, God, we just pray for your hand of protection. Uh, may our city flourish. May our city um, just uh, see wonderful things happen in the days to come. And may this be a place where your people uh, can shine bright. God, we thank you. We pray that your hand of protection will be upon them tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Please face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Peterson, before we start tonight, if we could <clears throat> just very quickly um, appeal to the public. We have a big event about to happen starting mid next month uh, through April, and that is the U.S. Census. That happens every 10 years, so the last one was in 2010. And the census is very, very important. In fact, the Constitution requires us to participate in the census and it asks that all persons be counted in our country. The other thing it matters is that federal appropriations, or that's money, that we get for various things such as education, transportation. Mr. Peterson, you want to name a couple of other things where money comes from the federal government? Well, um, as you mentioned, it, it, it deals for uh, your representation in Congress, your representation in the state legislature, uh, it's transportation funding, utility funding, public housing money, uh, there's, it, it really any kind of funding that flows from the federal and state governments to local government is based on census figures. This is uh, one of the most important things anyone in our community will be doing uh, this year and perhaps once a decade. Uh, to put it in terms that are really easy to follow, for every person that's counted, it's worth about $1,100 a year to our local government. So Times 10 years. Times 10 years. So for everybody that doesn't get counted, that costs us what about $11,000 that we have to make up in revenue somewhere else, which means your sales tax or your property tax. So if you get a chance, encourage all your friends, your relatives, your neighbors, folks that aren't your friends, relatives, and neighbors, <laughs> everybody <laughs> needs to be counted because everybody. it saves us all money. It's really important. Right. Let me add to that as well. It also <clears throat> impacts state representation. So your state representative, those districts may be redrawn based on the results of our census. Um, it's really important. We don't want to see a declining census simply because people don't respond to it or take the census. We had about an 83 percent return rate or response rate in 2010. So we need to be at least that and above. We need really a hundred percent. You will start seeing a lot of advertisement coming on TV soon, both local and national. Um, they also are trying to hire census takers. So once, once the main census, and, and they're going to be doing it online this year or on paper, either one, um, once that period has passed and they record who has not responded, 
then the census um, enumerators, as they're called, will go out into the neighborhoods and go knock on doors and try to get people to take the census. They are hiring for those positions. I think the starting uh, pay in our area is about uh, almost $16 an hour. You get a lot of steps in. You can get your Fitbit really wound up and get out there and walk the neighborhoods. Uh, but it's really, really important that we show who is here. Um, we count those who are here, and it, it has a huge impact on this community. The other thing, if it shows because people don't take the census that we're declining, when we're looking at trying to encourage new growth in our community, and a business looks at us and says, wow, that's a population that's going down. I don't know if that's where I want to go, when we know, in fact, we're really going up. So it's an important thing, and I would encourage all of you who are listening to this tonight to talk to your friends and neighbors and, and, um, and, and also help us let everybody know and encourage them to take the census um, at the same time. There will be several areas around town if you want to take it online uh, where computers will be set up. I think a lot of the senior centers um, and community centers will have computers if you want to do it, do it there. So you'll be seeing more about it. I think you'll be receiving a card in the mail in the next maybe two to three weeks. And once you get that card, the census will be open. And you can go online and you can do it early. I think the official date, Mr. Peterson, do you remember it's April, mid-April maybe? Yes, Somewhere like that. But once you get your card, you're eligible to go ahead and take your census. So anyway, I wanted to just throw that out. You'll hear it at our next meeting and the next meeting. So we want to really encourage everybody to participate. Thanks a lot. I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Peterson. First order of business is consideration of the minutes from your meeting held on Wednesday, February the 5th. Commissioners, for approval. there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Any other comments on the minutes? Ms. Jennings. Commissioner Calhoun? Yes. Commissioner Fowler? Yes. Commissioner Hunter? Yes. Vice Mayor Weiss? Yes. Mayor Bronk? Yes. Next is consideration of a beer license application for Magic Walk located at 701 South Run Street. This is for a Class 1 on-premise beer license. Uh, the business is in an appropriately zoned piece of property. All the reviews have been made, finding no disqualifying factors, and the recommendation is for your approval. Okay. Is the applicant present? If you would come forward, please. Come on up to the podium. How are you doing? Good, good. Just state your name and address, please. Uh, my name is Chao Wang, mm -hmm. and the address is 701 South Strong Street, Johnson City, Tennessee, 37601. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, commissioners, are there any, um, oh, excuse me, I need to ask you this question. Have you read the rules and regulations of selling beer in the city of Johnson City? Mm -hmm. And do you agree to abide by those? Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. Any questions, commissioners? Move for approval. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any other comments? Ms. Jennings. Commissioner Calhoun? Yes. Commissioner Fowler? Yes. Commissioner Hunter? Yes. Vice Mayor Wise? Yes. Mayor Brock? Yes. You want to tell us? I know where the magic walk is. I eat with you often. <laughs> but you're, on, you're going to be on TV, so you can uh, share with the, the public about your restaurant. Yeah, um, we used to have the beer lessons, but this is my uncle owned that time. But uh, when I take over, I change the name, they want the reply day. So the magic walk is, we opened uh, 28 years already since 1992. And still there, you know. I'm not saying it's pretty good, but it's not bad. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah, and also we have our restaurant a little bit different with other restaurants because I know there are too many Chinese restaurants in town, but we're doing American style Chinese food and authentic Chinese food since there are too many Chinese students in the ETSU. Yeah, this is the only difference. And then I hope everything going good. <laughs> Very good. Well, I highly recommend it, folks. Uh, they have great Singapore noodles there, which is one of my favorites. So thank you so much for right, coming. I think you can pick this up tomorrow. Okay. Jennings, is that tomorrow? Okay. okay. Good, good. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Commission, I'm going to scramble up the agenda here for a moment with your approval. Chief Turner, if you'd come up and uh, I'd like to make the presentation uh, by the United States Attorney Special Assistant presentation first <laughs> some of them are traveling back to they don't, they don't want to hear about our facilities management <laughs> I, I'm sure he's got a powerpoint and everything it's going to be great <laughs> exactly Chief, if you would introduce this item please sir thank you mr peterson uh, mayor brock commissioners uh, i have the pleasure of uh, introducing uh, members of the uh, united states attorney's 
office for the Eastern District of Tennessee. We've partnered with them for quite some time <clears throat> to uh, employ a special prosecutor which uh, prosecutes cases uh, in Johnson City. So those are uh, drug cases and gun cases uh, that meet federal guidelines for prosecution. So uh, I want to introduce them to you. We uh, join this is uh, the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Tennessee, Mr. Douglas Overby. Uh, also, uh, Assistant U.S. Attorney Wayne Taylor, our Special Prosecutor, Kateri Dahl, and uh, their PIO from their office, Ms. Rochelle Barnes. And so right now I'll turn it over, I guess, to Mr. Overby first, and then I think uh, Ms. Ms. Dahl had some information to share as well. Thank you, Chief and uh, Mayor and members of the uh, City Commission. Thank you for this opportunity again this year to, um, to come before you and express our appreciation for the great relationship enjoyed by our United States Attorney's Office and the City of um, Johnson City. Um, I think you've had a long day. I see you have a long ag agenda. I do want to say just, just a couple of things. Um, in our uh, office, uh, we have about a, a 120 folks, uh, about equally divided between support staff and assistant United States attorneys. Uh, 41 of those assistant United States attorneys are in the criminal division, which gives you a sense of where the weight of our office is. Plus, we have two special assistant U.S. attorneys. We have three or four main priorities, but one of our top priorities is working with local law enforcement to prosecute drug trafficking, gun crimes, and gang activity. And we do, we fulfill that priority through a couple of programs. One is called Project Safe Neighborhood. Project Safe Neighborhood is one of the most important tools for effective investigation and prosecution of violent criminals in your city has utilized the program to its full potential to create a positive impact uh, on this co uh, community. A Project Safe Neighborhood works in conjunction with what we call OSADEF, the Organized Crime and Drug Enforcement Task Force, which is a way of bringing together federal, state, and local resources together. A another project or another way through which we work together is through Project Guardian, which is a new initiative introduced by the Department of Justice at the end of 2019. And Project Guardian is a program to go after what we call lying and trying or lying and buying. That is, folks who are prohibited from, felons who are prohibited from owning guns, still try to own guns and they try and lie and they try to buy and that is to prevent them from doing that. Um, these programs have been successful across our district, but particularly in Johnson City. The Johnson City Police Department Special Inve Investigation Squad has participated in 64 felony and 39 misdemeanor arrest and 17 federal indictments uh, have come out of that. Many of those indictments have multiple defendants. Investigators have seized 33 firearms and experienced a 144% increase in the amount of methamphetamine seized in 2019. Working together, we are being effective. And that includes your participation and your funding for the current uh, Special Assistant U.S. Attorney, Kat Dahl. As of February 18, 2020, she is working on 22 cases with 31 defendants being investigated and prosecuted. The cases are in various stages. Two are convicted and sentenced. 16 are indicted and, and awaiting trial. And four were just recently indicted during the February grand jury session. There are 10 cases with firearm charges, 15 with drug trafficking charges, and five cases involving a larger drug trafficking conspiracy. The previous uh, special United States attorney uh, was Thomas McCauley. He was very effective. Uh, so effective, we put him on our staff as, as assistant United States attorney. 
but we are very pleased with the selection, your selection of Kat Dahl. Kat graduated from the University of Tennessee College of Law. She had previously interned in our, in our Greenville office in 2014 and 2015. Uh, after graduating from law school, she was the nominations counsel for the United States Foreign Relations Committee, United States Senate Foreign Relations Committee, under the chairman, United States Senator James uh, Risk. And she advised the chairman on all presidential nominations coming under their authority. We're glad to have her back in East Tennessee in our Greenville office and serving as a special assistant United States attorney. It's my pleasure to introduce to you and present at this time Kat Dahl. And should you have any questions, I'll, I'll be here. Um, I'd love to stay around for the entire meeting, but uh, you can scream it. It'll be on YouTube okay. tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. So. On your way home in yeah. your car. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Overy. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening. Hi. Um, so I'm Kat, and kind of to piggyback off what. Uh, U.S. Attorney Overby said, um, I've only been here for since about September, came from D.C., um, you know, my background as far as school uh, was University of Tennessee, and I'm just very privileged to be working on these cases because the community right now is in really need of them. Um, there's, you know, just a lot of, I'm sure everyone's aware that there is a spike um, in meth trafficking, you know, in the area, that's something that the country is seeing a surge in. And so it's extremely important uh, for us as a community to be seeing kind of this aggressive uh, prosecution of these larger conspiracies, especially when they extend outside of um, the, the area. I myself have four larger conspiracies. Um, it, they extend to North Carolina, to Georgia, um, to South Carolina, um, you're seeing conspiracies with uh, gang activity. Uh, there are numerous gangs that have recorded activity in this uh, area, including the, the Bloods, the Crips, um, various offshoots of you know white supremacy uh, groups. So these are kind of things that need this aggressive response, and it's something that's very worthwhile when you are seeing a larger um, sentencing um, in these cases. You're seeing longer sentences. A lot of my cases are looking at upwards of five years. There are the min uh, mandatory minimums that, you know, based on the drug weight, um, some defendants are looking upwards of 10 years. And that's something that uh, for serious offenders um, is, is greatly needed. You know, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have about, you know, the work that we're doing um, or the current climate um, with the, the, you know, criminal activity in the area. Um, but again, very pleased to be here. Thank you very much. What's it like living here compared to D.C.? <laughs> <laughs> um, better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Overby, Kat, and your staff. Y'all have been a great help to us, and uh, your work in connection with our folks is making a big difference in the community. Uh, I, guess, I guess one one way of looking at it, you go through the state court, you're probably going to serve 30% of your sentence. When you go through their court, you're going to serve day for day everything you're sentenced to, and it does provide a significant deterrent to illegal activity in our area. So thank you for all you do now and all you've done for us through the years in the state legislature as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Pete. Uh, I would also say, just to tack on, in the federal system, there there is no parole. So when that sentence is handed down, that sentence is what, what is served. But we value working with Chief Turner and his department, and thank you for your support. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Mayor, your next presentation is from Mr. Trivet, going to give us an update on all of our construction projects. Good. 
raise the microphone there. <laughs> yeah. Well, good evening, and I appreciate the opportunity to have to uh, give you guys an update on the capital projects that are going on inside the city. Um, it's an exciting time to be working in Johnson City, and I'm, I'm privileged to be able to kind of manage and oversee these projects as they go through. And the last time that I presented to you, I looked back on my minutes or my notes, and it was in September of last year. And uh, the city manager then asked me to do about eight or ten minutes, and I think it ended up taking me about 25 or 30. <laughs> so I've actually tried to streamline this one so so I can stay within the eight to ten minute range. But You're there's just from asking questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> there's just so much going on. It's it's exciting to kind of share all that with you, but. Uh, and I will be able to answer any questions that you may have as we go through this anytime. So um, the first thing, um, let me go back to the first page. Uh, for, I, I divided this into two groups, Johnson City Schools and then City Projects. Uh, all of those come under the umbrella of the city. This is things that have been funded through the city, uh, either PEP funds or the general fund or capital projects fund. But at the Johnson City Schools capital projects currently going on, you've got Liberty Bell Middle School that's happening with the gym and cafeteria addition, Indian Trail Intermediate School for the science labs and the storage, uh, Southside Elementary Classroom addition, uh, Lake Ridge Elementary Classroom addition, Woodland uh, School Maintenance Facilities Improvements, and then Topper Academy and Cherokee Elementary Partial Reroofing. I'm going to touch on all of these individually as we go through, except for number six and number seven. Those are projects that are so small. I just put those on here for your information um, and to kind of speed through. But if you look at this, the total of these capital projects is about $25 million. That's what's ongoing currently as we speak right now in some phase of construction, whether it's in A&E or in actual construction, but there's about $25 million there. Uh, Liberty Bell Middle School Cafeteria and Gym. This is an, uh, an exterior view shot of that with the gym in the background with the blue that's going around the top part. That's the extended roof for the gym. Uh, the closer part to this side is the cafeteria where the crane's setting on the back side of that. That's the cafeteria and the kitchen area that's being constructed currently. That's about a 40,000 square foot addition to, to the existing Liberty Bell School. Uh, this is the interior picture now of, of construction. You can see HVAC, mechanical works being roughed in with the duct work, but this is the cafeteria, uh, and it'll seat about 350 people or 350 students when it's completed. So they won't have to worry about having adding more uh, lunch shifts and things like that with three, seating capacity of 350. <coughs> how, many, how many lunches will be scheduled with this, do you think, roughly? Well, they're... they're 1300. They're 1300, so. So they'll still have to have about four. Um, this is the interior shot of the gym as the construction's going on. Uh, you can see uh, the floor's already been poured, concreted. Uh, they're protecting the floor. It's got a covering over it right now so that they don't damage it so they can get the athletic floor in. But the little offsets that are going back in are for the bleachers. Uh, and the bleacher seating capacity is 1300. So those are, that's some information I thought when you're out in the community, people would ask you about what we're doing there, but they'll be able to seat 1,300 people to watch any type of sporting event inside the gym or even have a full class or full school assembly if they need to. Um, this is the corridor leading down to the gym. This is coming from, there's, a, there's an enclosed corridor that's protected that comes from the existing school that accesses a common area, and that's where I'm standing with this picture being taken. And then this corridor leads straight down to the gym. And to the left, those openings are the gang bathrooms. You've got a large boys and a large girls restroom facility. Immediately to the left of this picture is the cafeteria, the entrance to the cafeteria. So everything flows and circles really well. And when they have like night games or things of the evening that the gym would be used, they'll be able to segregate off the cafeteria and those areas, but still be able to access the restroom facilities. But this is that area you see a lot of windows that's facing to the parking lot of the administration building of Liberty Bell. Uh, moving on to Indian Trail to the intermediate school. How close are we to the actual schedule of completion on that? Um, the, the contractor keeps telling me he's going to be finished by the end of June. 
Now I'm more of a realist, and and so every we have progress meetings every two weeks, and that's at the top of our agenda discussion every two weeks. We're 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 looking at what he's going to have completed within the next two weeks when we come back, and so by in, in this last progress meeting this past Tuesday, we discussed a, a target date of when he needed to have certain things done, like completely dried in. Uh, working on like right now the sprinkler rough ends are being completed the HVAC units are set on the roof of the gym uh, they're working on the insulation on the outside of the block bricks supposed to start next week uh, so there's a lot of things that are coming together but c continually pushing them to be done by July the 1st or July the 2nd but in reality I'm thinking it's going to be closer to the middle or the end of July just to be honest with you and we're working on a contingency plan if it, if it pushes us right up till when school starts so that we have something to continue to work on. And so those discussions are ongoing. We, he knows he's got to meet those deadlines. He knows there's liquidated damages. Uh, he knows there's got to have kitchen equipment set in there to, to train people. Um, and so he keeps feeling pretty confident that he's going to hit it. So when do the liquidated damages start? That they start on June. I think it's June the 20th, but there'll be times that he'll be able to put in for weather delays or weather extensions. And you know, the past three weeks we've had horrible weather. But I will say this, from the time that he started, every month there's a certain number of weather days that's built into each month based on the National Weather Service. And so every month he's had zero days to claim for weather. So he's had good weather, he's had good opportunity to do it. So. Do those allowances bank toward the future, or do those go away as each month? No, they do clicks? not bank. Okay. Yeah. And when you reviewed this with the school board, did they provide bumping the uh, the, the start of school back a week as a part of the, a potential contingency? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's not even a consideration yeah, just based on the entire cost. city. <laughs> you know. One of the good things is with that school, they're, they're already using a cafeteria and a gym. And so if they have to continue that till this gets completed, it's not going to be putting kids out in the cold or having them no place to have a phys ed or lunch. Uh, moving on to Indian Trail. Indian Trail is uh, uh, 60, converting 16 classrooms to science labs and then adding about a 5,600 square foot storage facility onto the back. The estimated budget on this project is about uh, 1.4 million dollars and if you notice these are some samples these are the actual classroom changes that they're going to be incorporating into the to the science labs they're going to be adding millwork adding sinks uh, right now they're not ADA accessible in some of them so we're going to be converting some of this millwork into ADA compliant uh, millwork uh, for a, a portion a percentage of the classrooms um, and then they'll add eye washes and then they're going to use portable science lab tables that they'll be able to relocate and move around in there as they're teaching their science classes in the, in the classrooms. Uh, the addition onto the back, this is a rendering of what the addition is going to look like onto the back and then there's a drawing on the side that's going to have orchestra storage and which was really amazing to me because they had no place right now with their auditorium to store all their band equipment and their orchestra equipment. This is going to have specialized cabinets that they'll be able to store it. It'll be climate controlled. Uh, they've got a science and technology storage area and a PE storage area and then just a basic general storage. And right now they're using locker rooms, they're using closets and, and classrooms to put their storage material in for phys ed and things like that. So this is going to be a big plus to them to be able to get back to using uh, the, those spaces for what they were intended to be used for. Uh, this is bidding in April of 2020. Uh, once construction we issue it, we'll bring it back to you all once we get a, a bidder who is uh, uh, considered the qualified bidder, uh, get it started this by this summer, uh, but it'll take about a year to complete. Uh, Southside Elementary School, uh, this is a four classroom addition. It's a second story add-on, so there's no site work. It's going up on the second floor that's already there. It was designed originally built to support a second story. Uh, and you can see how it's adding on to adjacent to an existing second story. And then I tried to put an elevation in to show you that's the front office. When you go up the big steps to the front door, 
that's the area that the second floor is going on. So it'll be, the construction will actually be taking place over administration and uh, office space and their, their conference room instead of over classrooms. So it won't be as distracting and disruptive to the class to the classes as it's going on. Uh, the estimated budget on this is about 1.5 million. And, and that's a big thing with the, uh, the no site work and the things that's going on. It's really helping us to stay in control budget on this. Now, one of the other things with these three school or these uh, three schools that we're adding on to, we're also incorporating uh, four year security. So we're looking at how to uh, secure off the four years so that when, and this is something the schools have been talking about for a while, so that people have to be buzzed in and then they have to be identified and signed in before they can gain access to the rest of the school. So that's part of this scope of work. And then also ADA playground component. Uh, right now, none of the schools have an ADA component in their playground systems for outside. So this is being incorporated into these three schools as well, as far as their scope of work. And all that's included in the cost of the uh, estimate. Uh, Lake Ridge Elementary School is an eight classroom addition, and it's a two-story addition. So there'll be four classrooms on each level. Um, and, and the building, the facility already has a library. There's a lot more site work that's going to have to be done to Lake Ridge. We're going to have to re remove some playground equipment, flip a basketball court, add some parking. They're working on how to load and unload for the buses to make sure that that doesn't block traffic on a, on a public street. Uh, we're also doing the ADA um, playground component, the security in the foyer, and also adding some canopies. It's a long way back to the entrance at Lake Ridge from the bus drop-off and the parent drop-off, and they have no canopy, so we're incorporating some canopies into this uh, work scope, too. Uh, this estimated budget's about $4.7 million for this project. Woodland Elementary School is uh, eight classrooms addition as well, but it's a one-story school, so both of those would be two wings that would come off of there to have four classrooms on each wing. So uh, a lot more site work. Also, Woodland had an issue with uh, parents dropping off and picking up, blocking the main road. And so we've incorporated into this to change where the buses uh, drop off, where the loop's at, convert the loop over to the left-hand side, add a road all the way around the building so that parents can stage all the way back come around, drop off on the passenger side, and then drive back out to the street. So it'll stack a whole lot of cars in there. They won't have to be crossing traffic again. So it's a lot safer. And then as well, we're doing the uh, four-year security and the ADA playground there as well. And this budget is about $6 million. And the reason this one's a little higher, even though it's eight classrooms, is the H this building's about 30-some years old, and we had the HVAC evaluated and we're going to have to upgrade the HVAC for the entire building not only and, and also incorporate the new addition. So this one's going to be a little more expensive with all the site work that's involved in it. Okay, going into city capital projects, uh, this is a list of the city projects, public work storage facility, the solid waste recycle building, which we just finished, and I wanted to share that with you. The last time I was here, I shared some of the other buildings that we'd finished with Langston, uh, the police training center and some of that. So I wanted to share this one with you as well. The downtown breezeway wall that's going to be on here in 2029, I guess, <laughs> in a way that keeps going. Uh, Carver splash pad, the public library roof, uh, Rotary Park and Tannery Knob bike trails restrooms, uh, Freedom Hall skylight replacement and exterior stairs, um, and water sewer service center facility in phase one, which is more of a site acquisition and an A and E design and site schematic work, uh, but if you as you notice here, all this totals to a little over six million dollars. So this is actual work that's ongoing right now. When you add those two together, that's about thirty one, thirty one and a half million dollars of capital projects that the city's working on right now. So that's why I said it was a very exciting time to be in Johnson City with all this going on. The public works storage facility uh, is, is three post steel buildings. They're approximately about 35,450 square feet. This budget project budget's $3 million, and this has taken place down at the old Bolton Block property as you go down into there. And so you can see they've got a lot of things underground. Um, they've got, they had to have a retention pond, underground stormwater drainage, 
uh, water, sewer, all those things that come in underground, and then they've started forming up and pouring the slab. Uh, once the, all the buildings, all the metal buildings are on site, they're ready to start erecting. They're telling me that by the end of the month or the first of next month uh, that they should start erecting the buildings and moving from building to building as they go and pouring the slabs. And that will be for, Ms. Peterson, that will be for public works vehicles to be parked in. Leaf solid cover, waste, leaf solid machines. Waste machines, leaf machines, brush trucks, yeah. trailers, those types of things. Yes, ma'am. They're very large and they have like this building that we're looking at on the left there with the slab has drive through garage doors so that they can take those uh, brush trucks that have the long trailers. They're about 50 foot long. They can pull in one side and then pull out the back side and come back out with garage doors on both sides. And then one, one component's an open three-sided building, so it's, it's going to be very handy for them to be able to keep their equipment out of the weather. And these extend the lives of all of those vehicles that are very expensive vehicles, so we Absolutely. don't have to buy them as often. Absolutely. That's the reason we're doing this. Absolutely. Okay. How much is garbage truck, Phil? 600000 325 so yes, anything, anything, any life we can add to a $300,000 vehicle, we, we try our best. Yes. Um, and then the solid waste uh, recycle building, uh, this is the finished product inside and just so happened when I went down to take a picture there was a tractor trailer backing in uh, to load up some things so you can see the vastness of this building. Uh, the I-beams the that are holding up the roof were used to be these small kind of angle iron trusses that every time a vehicle would go in there, they would hit them or, or bend them or break them. So we went in and re-poured uh, supports to go up and put those angle those I-beams inside to hold up the roof and, and then refurbished all the block that was cracked and missing. And so this, product, this project budget was $563,000 and it turned out extremely, extremely well. It's about a 25, 26,000 square foot facility that you could not build anywhere for $563,000 and get the space and, the, and what you need there. So I wanted to show you that. It is 100% completed, and as you can see, they're using it. The downtown breezeway wall, uh, this project budget's about 141,000, and with weather, com with weather permitting, they should be finished in about two weeks. And I know I say that all the time. This was the first project that I was assigned when they hired me at the city, and it's still on my plate, and I would love to be able to mark this thing off. And you've been uh, with us how many years now, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> numerous. <laughs> but it's actually, they've got the brick completely finished. That's how the brick will look. And then the top of that brick that goes down through, it's about 15 foot tall. There's some precast concrete that sits on top of that, and then everything else will be waterproofed all the way up. And I think the JCDA has plans to uh, refurbish this area on both sides of the breezeway, do some painting, do some other artwork and some things like that. We are going to, our facilities crew already has the lights purchased that'll go down and hang on the brick, and they're the teardrop uh, lights that'll go through on both sides. and. We, and then also we, we ran conduit down the back side of this brick to Main Street so that we could put a service panel on Main Street for all the festivals and everything that happened so people could garner power in that area because there's no power in that spot. And so we're going to set up a permanent power uh, panel down there for those festivals. And hopefully the next time I come back to talk to you, this will be a fond memory. <laughs> Uh, Carver Splash Pad Project, and, and this is actual um, rendering that the, the company, and this is on your agenda tonight for you all to consider uh, for this, uh, this company who was the qualified uh, proposal uh, for this, but this will go at Carver Rec Center. Uh, it's about 3,500 square feet. Project budget's about 416,000, and it's got features on here for all ages. Uh, and so we're very excited about that. Uh, I think that'll be a great addition to Carver Rec. Uh, we're really hoping if you all approve this tonight that we're going to try to to get a um, notice to proceed as quickly as possible. We're working with First Tennessee Development District with a grant that's paying a local park and rec grant that pays 50% of this. So we've got to go through some approval processes through them after your all's approval. But we really hope to get started on this here within the next couple months. 
Uh, Rotary Park and Tannery Knob Bike Trail Restrooms. The estimated budget for both of these is about $160,000. Uh, this is kind of the style of the bathroom to save money so that we don't and don't you know don't we don't want this news to get out. But this these buildings were so small. I, I like to save money, but we didn't we didn't hire an architect or an engineering firm to do this. I actually did this on the computer so that we could. Uh, Get this through building and get it out to bid and get building a per permit per approval but you can see it's a very simple bathroom um, single single use uh, it meets ada requirements ada standards and has a plumbing chase in the back so that we can drain the water and do everything we need to do to winterize these facilities it's 80 each 80 right it's 160 for both or it's a hundred thousand for the one on tannery and sixty thousand for the one on at rotary so that's how i come up with a hundred and sixty thousand the one on tannery is going to be connected to city sewer city water it so is. it's a real bathroom not a yes not a port whatever the, the that that was part of the things we that was part of the things we had to work out and we i worked with uh, tom witherspoon they figured out a way to get water and sewer up there and and they're going to get it up there to the building so when we bid this out the contractor will bid and attach to what they provide do you know where we're going to place that i do uh we met up there with mr ellis and mr stall to look at a placing it in a good place where we could access it easily and and we're looking at you know where the building's sitting now where the staff sits when you first pull in we're thinking about putting it there and adding a space onto the side for the staff to sit in so that it'll be one building with a staff uh, office and then the, the restrooms right there at that location. But also we need water up there. Um, there'll be water for the bathroom. There's a water, water fountain. fountain. I know, but it's so far away. If you go talk to the users up there. Well, we're, we're putting a pump in to get the water there, so uh, it, it wouldn't be it. beyond reason to say we could pump water up to the to the pump track or something another if we needed to put in. another outside uh, water fountain up there. I've just talked to some parents who take their smaller children up there and they need water and you know then they've got to go all the way to the other end of the parking lot to to get, water. get it out of the thermos that they've got up there. Yeah. You'd just, never know there wasn't an architect involved. I mean it. Yes. Well thank you. And we won't tell anybody. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> I didn't put my name on it. There's, there's a lot to be said for that. <laughs> Uh, any questions? See, I told you I streamlined this a lot better, didn't I? Okay. That, that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of projects, and I appreciate the opportunity to get to work on those. Thank you so much. You. I, I know the schools have to be very happy that uh, this works on the way now. They are. They're very happy and excited about moving forward, and that's you know they talk about that a lot. So I appreciate it. We don't want uh, that secret to get out that you drew that because I'm afraid Tesla might come and get you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Your next order of business is to make one appointment to the Johnson City Public Library Board. Um, the packet contains a recommendation from the library board. And this appointment is due to the resignation of Mr. Michael Clark. And Julia is here. Ms. Turpin, how are you? Good evening, how are you? Good, we're doing fine, thank you. Good. Uh, we have one recommendation. Do you want to go ahead and uh, present that to sure. us? Sure. Mm -hmm. The Johnson City Public Library Board met in January and unanimously recommended Mr. Scott Jeffress um, from Johnson City to fulfill the remaining portion of that term. Okay, and the term. and. What's the time span for that? So all, all term, terms start in July, mm -hmm. um, and Mr. Clark had served about a year and a half, so this term will expire in June of 2020. Okay. So two more years. Oh, 2022. 20, 22, yes. Okay. I was going to say, so this is just three months of 22, right? yes. No. Okay. All right. Be good. Thank you. Commissioners? I move for approval of their second <laughs> nomination. <Yeah. laughs> okay. We have a motion and a second. Any other questions? <laughs> Ms. Turpin? Ms. Jennings? Commissioner Calhoun? Yes. Commissioner Fowler? Yes. Commissioner Hutter? Yes. Vice Mayor Wise? Yes. Mayor Brock? Yes. And thank you for all the work y'all do at the library. We have something to really be proud of, of how thank much you. our library is used. And I can't wait for the natural park to open up down below you in the outdoor classroom that I know you're going to be able to do a lot of extension 
We're excited. Work down there. And the new roof. Those the are new, always fun We're really to buy. excited about the new roof. Yeah. I'm, I, I don't know why it wasn't featured in the presentation. <laughs> <Uh-oh>. yeah. <laughs> it's a glamorous addition to the library. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for your support. Your next order of business is consideration of the consent agenda. Commissioners, do you have any items you would like to pull? Commissioner Calhoun? No, ma'am. Commissioner Hunter? No, ma'am. Commissioner Fowler? Um, 7.3.2. 7.3.2. Very good. Uh, Vice Mayor? That was the only one I wanted to pull. Okay. And all of mine have been addressed, so we'll take those. The first one... Um, is 7.3.2. And shall we pull that and vote on that separately? Probably easiest. Okay, so make a motion for, for that. To, to pull that and we'll vote on it. I'd separately. make that motion. Okay. I'd say. All right, the motion is to pull 7.3.2 and vote on that separately from the consent agenda. Okay. Ms. Jennings, would you call the roll? Commissioner Calhoun? Yes. Commissioner Fowler? Yes. Commissioner Hunter? Yes. Vice Mayor Wise? Yes. Mayor Brock? Yes. Okay, Mr. Peterson, we will take 7.3.2. 7.3.2 is consideration of the sale of property located at 316 Commerce Street. We issued a uh, request for proposal or bid on this. Uh, we had two responders both meeting the minimum bid amount for the property. We also asked them to supply their intended reuse with site plans and, and elevations, uh, the, uh, how they intended to use the property. Uh, both of them have proposed multi-use buildings that would involve residential and either commercial or retail or, or office space in conjunction. Uh, Mr. Manzi owns an adjacent piece of property to the property in question that we have. Um, so he would have the opportunity to combine those two pieces into, into one development. Uh, Mr. Campbell's uh, proposal just involves the city-owned piece at uh, 316. There was, uh, so that, that kind of sums up what you've got before you and I assume you have questions of the proposers I think we probably do uh, commissioners would y'all like I, I do have a, a question mr. Manzi if I could sure. um, and I appreciate the renderings that you sent in that was very very helpful you have an adjacent piece of property do you plan if you were to get this the development on this piece of property with the other one that you own is there some kind of contiguous development that you're considering there or uh, how will that how will you you work that seeing, being that you have the other property right so the whole purpose of purchasing the that property is I want to combine the two and and have a larger building put on it for the the purpose that I, w I was mentioning a bakery and um, a coffee shop bakery so I would, coffee shop. yeah so they're both my current lot is zoned industrial obviously it's part of the and so is that lot and actually, I was initially, um, I approached the city to buy it for that purpose. You own 312. Mm -hmm. Right yeah. beside it, yeah. And, and I hope, like I said, it'll bring tax revenue, obviously, both from a business perspective as well as um, from all the employees being hired, about 15 employees. Do you have, do you anticipate needing any of the right of way that's in front of both parcels? No, I talked to Phil Pinzola before, um, and there's that side street that comes down, so I'll utilize that mm -hmm. to, do the, to do the project. Okay. But you don't need any of that for your project. That would just be your access. No, but I would like to have it. I'll take more the merrier. Well, no, I'm not handing it out. <laughs> <I> just... <laughs> yes. No, I don't yeah, need okay. it for my project. Uh, so you're planning a coffee shop, bakery, yeah. and upstairs so I, residential? No, no. Okay. Uh, no residential. It's okay. full commercial. So it might be two stories commercial. I would like to have a view because there's a pretty view of the, of the mountains. And then I just thought because the park is so utilized that, you know, there's a lot of dogs, there's people at night. And I just thought it'd be a cool place. You have a few picnic tables outside, have a balcony. And um, I have people that are interested in the coffee shop as well as doing uh, a full bakery right there. Any other questions, Mr. Manzi? Actually, Mr. Peterson, if either of these, we're going to have to 
switch from industrial to mixed use or something like that, no matter who, who buys this? Yes, sir. Okay. So it'll have to be rezoned then? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, sir. But it would be no different than the property on Highland. We rezoned MX1 earlier in the year. Right. It, it would not. Um, you know, and Preston and I have had this conversation. There is a limited amount of public parking up on that end of Founders that gets used with regularity. And we've got a couple of <coughs> annual special events that are dependent on that existing parking lot for staging part of their event. We need to think through carefully what the zoning is going to be. Uh, I, I would recommend to you that we not allow a use that becomes dependent on the existing public parking lot to support that business in its entirety. We, we need to have some on-site parking somewhere because it's going gonna, it's gonna, to, it could potentially create some problems with special events if the parking lot is, is being utilized for uh, residents or business uses there and you want to have a special event. Uh, if, if they don't have any other accessible parking for the business or the residents developed on these properties, then we're going to have to sift through that at some point in time. So we, we just need to think through how we zone it. Should we have rezoned it first before we put it up for I, sale? I, it, it, I don't think it makes any difference one way or the other, to be honest. And there's some right away that we could sell for parking beside this? I've got the, the you got, picture. You've got, got the, the map picture. in front right. of you. Um, it's got the so everything the, between commerce, between street commerce and the, the lot lines on that map you have in front of you mm -hmm. is part of the right of way. So yes, that there is additional property there that could be used for uh, to be sold as part of a development there. You could use it for uh, it's probably not big enough for public parking, but you could do uh, some Against different the, uses with it, yes, sir. Yeah. What's, you, your, what's your timetable if you were to acquire the property? Probably start construction in 2021 because the time you get the plans, you get it through the city. Mm -hmm. um, I know they want to move, one of the tenants want to move faster than that, so I mean, it just depends. But mm -hmm. I would start working on it immediately. But I know from putting what I'm putting on Dipton Street, it, it took about five, six months to get the architectural plans drawn and everything. Thank you. Yep, you will. Thank you. Mr. Campbell, you want to come and tell us a little bit about your project? Since this is city-owned property, we did kind of put some some uh, requirements in there and what we'd like to see, you know, on that property. Um, on your submission, you gave a narrative of, of I think, kind of some mixed use that you want to put in. Didn't see any um, kind of elevations, but you had the schematics on location on the property. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what your thoughts what are? What I had proposed is <clears throat> have that as a transitional type uh, use between some of the commercial and the residential area. Uh, have first floor would be commercial and similar to what uh, <clears throat> Mr. Manzi is talking about as far as some balconies and, and uh, patios and that kind of thing. Uh, and one of the plans that I submitted shows the entrance coming off of Lamont Street and some parking in that area. Uh, and of course, just about any use, given the size of the lot, is going to require some parking in uh, the Founders parking lot, uh, at least in my opinion. Um, and of course, I didn't do any design, but basically what we're talking about is, is you know, a nice contemporary looking building that would face kind of toward the uh, state of Franklin. And uh, I think it'd be something. I've worked for an architect 20 years, and then I've done a bunch of renovations downtown, and most everybody seems to think they look pretty nice. So, you know, we'd do something pretty good quality. And uh, I'm not talking about you know, vinyl siding and asphalt shingles and stuff like that. We're talking about something that would be metal and steel and glass and brick and something that'd be nice and, you know, some upscale that would fit in. Probably as nice in the as 350 Randy's four. bathrooms. Excuse me. As nice as Randy's bathrooms at the park. Well, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. <clears throat> and by the way, he did a great job. Yeah. So, I mean, there may be some architects that may be talking to him. But, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> but, uh, um, and and one of the drawings I think has a 3,000 square foot footprint, and one has a I think a 2,400 square foot footprint. And of course, once you go through rezoning, I'd have 
ample drawings to, to submit for the rezoning that would, you know, make sure we met all the criteria as far as the stormwater detention and, and that kind of thing. But uh, I, I certainly don't have anything negative to talk about his proposal. I'm sure it'll work out fine. But, uh, but we're talking about a $350,000, $400,000 building, and uh, the apartments that would be located up top would be real nice and of course you know there's a real demand for housing in that area with the uh, proximity of the downtown and uh, and that kind of thing and then also with the university so. but then the downstairs likely to be office or well office like or that. some uh, commercial um, you know I, I haven't really talked to real estate brokers but basically everything that uh, is available in that immediate area is, is taken up pretty quickly. I just finished a, a GEICO build out in University Center today and um, you know those spaces small that's 1500 square foot and it leased up real quick and there's another commercial space that's already been leased in that and so there's real demand for that area around the university and with access to state of Franklin so I think that it would be and I think it'd be a real good transitional use because it blend multifamily and with the with the commercial space. Questions of Mr. Campbell? Thank, Thank you so you much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, commissioners, I, th I think, you know, we, when we first started looking at rezoning some other property in that area, I think y'all heard me say that I haven't been really wild about you know, commercial development right here at the end of Founders Park because of the homes there. But because we are, it's really important to me now what goes in there, that it's supportive of that area. It looks really good um, and, you know, can be an amenity that when people are in the park, you know, could, could use. So um, those are just kind of some of the things that are in my mind, but let me throw it open for discussion and let's have a motion. Anyone? I'll make a couple of comments. Um, both, I, I, I'm confident, Mr. Mancy and Mr. Campbell both do good work. I mean, that's that's not not an issue, and um, both of them are good partners to the city. So this is a this is not easy, and we'd like to. Do we have another lot that we could just sort of? <laughs> Actually, we do. We do. <laughs> <laughs> just sort of set you up there. Um, in this case, I'm inclined to support the the mixed use. Uh, just from the the transition from from re, from uh, residential to have residential and retail, um, and the fact that it's just the, the the bid was minimal higher. That's not a reason to to make a decision, but just my comments about that. I, I will also make a comment. Um, Mr. Mancy owns the lot beside it, which would be a a little easier to build on and could have more parking there that we need for his for his project and not use as much of Founders Park if we are using the front of both of those lots for the parking if he can obtain that right away to put that right in front of the building all the way up in front of both of those lots so I would tend to do that but I I like Mr. Campbell too and I don't want to make him mad at me but I kind of <laughs> like Mr. Nancy's a little bit better, so okay. that's my, my two cents, anyway. All right. um, well, we've had uh, comments on both sides, so if does anyone want to step forward and make a motion? What are the plans with the lot at the end of Highland that the city owns and recently rezoned MX1? MX. Will, will we do an RFP on it as well? Uh, you can do that. We've uh, there's actually two lots two there. Lots there. One, well, the, yeah, one has. I'm talking just about the end lot. The, the end two, lot. Two on the, the, we did MX. Did yeah, we did we the did MX. MX. One of them was our four. Or our, the end anyway, one is Habitat, the MX Habitat's one. got the one next to the end yes. one. The end one right now, we have a request from Habitat to do another house there. Yeah, but I would be interested in doing an RFP to yeah. see if sure. there aren't others because I, I guess I would echo I'm 
I see both projects as good and valid. I think Mr. Manzi's ownership of the adjacent lot sets up a scenario for something that has greater prospects for success than on the smaller single lot. Having said that, I think that Mr. Campbell might be able to do what he's envisioned doing really just down the street effectively and create that nice buffer between the public park and then the residential area in that, I guess, is that mountain home at that point or you have to go a little further down before you're in the mountain? I anyway, that, that neighborhood. neighborhood. Yeah, yes. okay. The corner of Whitney and Highland. Yes, one. It's it's just adjacent yeah, to our parking right lot right there. Right, it's just right at, the end, at the end. At the end of the parking lot. It's in the picture. Yeah. Do you yeah. know um, the size of that lot compared to the one that we're talking it about tonight? Looks bigger than on here. I I don't, but just looking at it, I would say it's thirty percent bigger, forty percent bigger. It's it, it's a bigger piece of property now. The way it, how does it lay? Topographically, it's not are that. you going to have to do retaining walls? <coughs> I, I, I don't know. I hadn't, hadn't thought through that. Neither of them are are flat elevations. The, the lot in question tonight is flat in East Tennessee terms. <laughs> <laughs> it's flat adjacent. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, so do we just need a motion? Is that what you're asking for? I would make a motion. Now, I would be interested, can we put some kind of time frame on doing something with this so it doesn't sit idle for years? I mean, could we do something where we this, accept this an offer? This is not an ordinance dealing with land use. This is the sale of real property. So you have the right to put any kind of uh, requirements or restrictions on this piece of well, property I just thought, as any other in terms property of a owner. couple of years or something i mean not sure to can. but just not to have it sit there idle for yes five well, or ten years i think that's a very commendable idea or yes, to resell i mean it, it needs to be used for intended purpose yes ma'am so how right. would you yeah i mean that would certainly be consistent i mean so a motion to accept mr mancy's proposal contingent on pulling permits in 30 months is that I mean, uh, two and I, I a half years? A, I thought he said he, you could do it this year. I'd like to start construction like at the end of this year. Well, pulling permits. Permit would, plans, if I, if you, you said 24 months after that problem. Okay. Well, then 24 months and subject to reversion. Of some, how would you, is there a way that that should be articulated more effectively? Okay. If you wanted to, uh, so you want permits pulled or construction Permits done? pulled in 24 months. Okay. Approve the proposal by Mr. Manzi contingent upon building permits being pulled within 24 months and to make it easier on him and everybody else the property wouldn't actually transfer until the point in time that the building permits were pulled. Because if you transfer the property and for some reason something happens to Mr. Manzi and the permits are never pulled, how are you ever going to enforce something happening in 24 months? Make sense? So what would you add to this? So the modification would be tr transfer subject to the permits being pulled? I think that language would work, yes sir. Does that work for you? Can you explain it? Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, we're all confused. Yeah. Get the property. Well, I mean, I'm just concerned that then he doesn't own it if he's trying to go <laughs> and put deals get together, couldn't get yeah. a loan. I don't know that we need to have a time frame. I mean, I don't think either one, but, uh, you know, I mean, in some situations, I think that's needed for sure. I think for me it's important not to sell this for it to be resold and then we lose control of what's going to be there. I mean, right. It's at the end of a very visible park. Right. I mean, I think our concern is it's right. um, It's more because it's so close to Founders Park, which is also part of its appeal. So I'll withdraw that and just make it a motion to accept Mr. Manzi's proposal if others are comfortable enough to just keep it simple. 
And if there's no second, I will take that to mean others are not comfortable. Can the project be completed in 24 months? <laughs> it's been so this. Depends on, yeah, I got to get the tenants and the lease agreements and all that stuff done and the plan strong. So I definitely can, I promise you I will start it as soon as I get the property, but I'll need to own it. In order right, to get right, it. I understand that. But I will start just like I worked on Tipton Street. I, I came through and I did it. Did the same thing with Freiburg's. I, I went through oh. and did it. Yeah. Mr. Manzi, the folks in the control room are getting agitated that you are not speaking into the microphone so our <laughs> friends at home have no idea who we're talking to or what you are saying <laughs> yes please thank you Wendy sure <laughs> I said um, in regards to getting the project done I plan on starting it immediately but I don't obviously I have to do all the plans and get it all going but I I built Freiburg's and did what I said I was going to do same thing with Tipton Street you all were kind enough to <coughs> sell the lot beside and um, we're, because of the weather we've been two weeks behind we're ready got all our permits ready to break ground so um, I want to get that project off the ground and at the same time do this and I have two tenants that are willing to do it now so my answer it's going to be done now I mean these people are like I had to tell I wouldn't even tell one where it was located I mean, they, they really want to do it now and the other person and I've been talking about this for a year well, we know where to find you. You know where to find me. <laughs> I'm a man of my word. Okay, so there's a motion. You want to repeat that, Vice Mayor? Just to accept Mr. Manzi's proposal on this <clears throat> lot and, and not as a part of the motion, encourage Mr. Campbell to look at this other lot that's just down the street because I think it will do what you need. Yeah, it's, it's in the same map picture that we're looking at. I will second. And there's a second. Okay, any further discussion or questions? None? Ms. Jennings? Commissioner Calhoun? Uh, no, and just in support of the other proposal. Commissioner Fowler? Yes. Commissioner Hunter? Uh, no, as well. Uh, I mean, I think this is a fine project, but um, you know, I Mayor, prefer the other. Sorry. You're fine. Mayor Wise? Yes, but in support of the other project as well, but I think we have another lot that will work for that. Mayor Brock? Maybe the swing vote. <laughs> Thank you very much. Keeps the drama vote. high. I'm going to vote yes. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. All right. <clears throat> We're ready to move on. Okay. Oh, point of clarification. Do you want us to issue an RFP on the lot? Yes. On yes. the corner of Whitney and uh, <coughs> Highland. Highland. Yes. Bill, yes. can, can we Thank you, make a motion for that? Do it. You need well, a motion. You need a motion. No, sure. okay. you do it without it. All right. All right. So we have the remainder of the consent agenda. Is there a motion to Mr. accept? Approved. It? Second. Motion and a second. Any other discussion, Ms. James? Commissioner Callahan. Yes. Commissioner Fowler. Yes. Commissioner Hunter. Yes. Vice Mayor Wise. Yes. Mayor Brock. Yes. Next is Ordinance 4728-20, an ordinance to amend the zoning map of the city well, of Johnson. Don't we have the rest of the consent? We just we just, we just, we just do that. I thought yeah. we just did the man. It's I'm sorry. Right. Never mind. 2020. That's right. I got the year right. Thank you. You can vote on it again if you want to. No, no. <laughs> Keep reading. Uh, Sorry. And ordinance to amend the zoning map of the city of Johnson City, Tennessee, being part of the appendix to ordinance number 1519, entitled an ordinance to adopt the code of laws and ordinances for the city of Johnson City, Tennessee, and to repeal all laws and ordinances in conflict therewith and a mandatory thereof by changing from B1 Neighborhood Business District to PB Plan Business District, certain property located at 3061 South Rome Street is ready for your consideration on second reading after public hearing. Son, if you just give us a brief update and we will open the public hearing. Thank you, ma'am. <coughs> Before you say request to rezone a piece of property at 3061 South Rome Street from B1 Neighborhood Business District to PB planned uh, business district. The applicant intends to use this property as it is for a fitness center. The area is essentially commercial in character. This shows the land use, the current land use along South Rhone Street is all commercial. Um, access to it will only be from South Rhone Street, which is an arterial road. It handles commercial traffic. There will not be any access from the residential properties in the rear. This proposal aligns with the future land use map that designates this property 
for commercial development. The Planning Commission recommended approval at its meeting on January 14. Okay, thank you. I will open the public hearing um, on the ordinance is 4728-20. Uh, is there anyone here to speak for or against? Okay, seeing no one, I will close the public hearing. Commissioners? Move for approval. Second. Motion and a second. Any other comments? Ms. Jennings? Commissioner Calhoun? Yes. Commissioner Fowler? Yes. Commissioner Hunter? Yes. Vice Mayor Wise? Yes. Mayor Brock? Yes. Ordinance number 4729-20. An ordinance to amend the zoning map of the city of Johnson City, Tennessee, being part of the appendix to ordinance number 1519, entitled an ordinance to adopt a code of laws and ordinances for the city of Johnson City, Tennessee, and to repeal all laws and ordinances in conflict therewith, and amendatory thereof by changing from B4 planned arterial business and R4 medium density residential to PB planned business district, and from B4 and R4 to RO2 medium density residential professional office district, Certain properties along Watauga Road and Fairhaven Drive is ready for your consideration on second reading after public hearing. Preston. Thank you, Mr. Peterson, Mayor, Commission. Uh, this item here is out in the eastern part of the city. Uh, uh, you'll see QEP on the screen there, and this is about a third of a mile, a little bit further east from the uh, Pepsi plant. Um, as Mr. Peterson noted, this involves eight pieces of property. Um, uh, this is a city-initiated rezoning, was originally uh, initiated to correct a split zoning here on 2532, and then it, it grew into the uh, current request that you have before you. Um, Planning Commission was unanimous in their support for this rezoning, uh, and I'll turn it back over to you for the public hearing. Very good. Thank you. We'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone to speak for or against the rezonings on this property? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing. Commissioners? Move for approval. Second. Motion and a second. Any other comments? Ms. Jennings? Commissioner Calhoun? Yes. Commissioner Fowler? <coughs> yes. Commissioner Hunter? Yes. Vice Mayor Wise? Yes. Mayor Brock? Yes. Ordinance number 4730-20. An ordinance to amend section 4.6 on one principal building per lot of the zoning code of the city of Johnson City. Ready for your consideration on second reading after public hearing. Mayor Commissioners, this is a staff-initiated amendment to the zoning ordinance on section 4.6. The current rendering of the code generally restricts, uh, generally calls for only one principal building on each lot in the city. This amendment simply just clarifies the language. It doesn't change the development practice we have in the city. Okay. Single-family residential neighborhoods will continue to have just one principal building per lot and all other districts can have multiple buildings. Thank you. We'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone to speak for or against these text amendments? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing. Commissioners? Move for approval. Second. Motion and a second. Any other comments, questions? I Mr. still love oh. Mr. Asang's uh, memo here requiring further inferential hermeneutics on whether specific zoning districts, I had to look up hermeneutics, <laughs> but uh, kudos to you, sir. You changed it in the first page, but it's still in the memo. <laughs> <laughs> He's teaching us something. That's right. Oh, it's a good Mr. word. Jennings. Commissioner Calhoun? Yes. Commissioner Fowler? Yes. Commissioner Hunter? Yes. Vice Mayor Wise? Yes. Mayor Brock? Yes. And if I may, I would bet that Pat Gowen knew what that word meant long before she had to look it up. <laughs> Uh, your next order of business is consideration of ordinance number 4727-20, an ordinance to amend the fiscal year 2020 budget passed by ordinance number 4692-19. This is just a budget amendment that you have uh, seen before you, which adjusts revenues and expenditures for projects that we've undertaken. Move approval. Second. Motion and a second. Any other questions of Mr. Peterson? Ms. Jennings. Commissioner Calhoun? Yes. Commissioner Fowler? Yes. Commissioner Hunter? Yes. Vice Mayor Wise? Yes. Mayor Brock? Yes. The next order of business is consider support of a motion from for the Chancellor to strike back taxes on properties located at 1712 Orlando Street and 413 West Main Street. Wasn't there some question on Monday night? about this on that the, we need to check on? Uh, there was, and we're good to go with it. Yes, sir. 
and, and what this is, these are properties that there are back taxes owing on it. The, uh, this is a support of the chancellor approving uh, doing away with the back taxes and I think the county is uh, working with Appalachian Service Project to transfer these properties so that uh, we can get vacant properties developed and get people into good housing and get properties on the tax rolls again. They're going to build new affordable housing I, on these sites. That's correct. Yes, okay. Move approval. Second. Motion and a second. Any other comments? <clears throat> Ms. Jennings. Commissioner Calhoun. Yes. Commissioner Fowler. Yes. Commissioner Hunter. Yes. Vice Mayor Wise. Yes. Mayor Brock. Yes. Next order of business is consider approval of an agreement with the Boone's Creek Historical Trust. Mr. Stahl, if you come forward, please, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Commissioners, about 11 years ago, the city purchased uh, property on 632 Hales Chapel Road, which we know to be the Kefauver Farm property. It was purchased with the support of the Park Board and the City Commission as a future park site, as well as we were open to other amenities and partnerships uh, uh, without uh, necessarily knowing exactly what we would plan out there. Uh, we did purchase that site, it uh, comprises of 53.93 acres. And it is a been reserved for development of a park and other uses. We have not uh, instituted a master plan yet that we have been in dialogue over the years with various folks and partnerships, potential partnerships on the park site. And eight years ago, when I was on the Park Recreation Board at the time, we were approached by the Boone's Creek Historical Trust on potentially using the Kefauver Farm property for development of its uh, mission. And it is a 501c3 organization which is dedicated to the preservation, restoration, and promotion of the Tennessee's first community, which of course is Boone's Creek. And they met with us, uh, I think they invited city commissioners at the time, and uh, you know, not only at the Park and Recreation Board meeting, but we also were invited to Boone's Creek Christian Church to look at their various artifacts and programming, and with the hope that they could possibly use the site as a home uh, for its uh, mission as well as explore other programming over the years. So this started my, my, my recollection back in 2012, but they have uh, consistently uh, you know, revisited the interest uh, from time to time, and some of you commissioners may have been part of those recent conversations. Back in October, uh, Pete Peterson and myself received a letter from uh, Lily Hensley, who's the president of the Boone's Creek Historic Trust, and that was back in October, and they voted by majority to accept the, uh, the offer of the city to utilize or otherwise lease a certain portion of the property at the Kefauver Farm uh, for the purpose of using the house and existing barn as a home for the trust. And uh, they hoped that uh, we would move forward and develop uh, uh, some um, lease agreement for the use, which we have done, and we have shared it with the trust and uh, we met with you all most recently to discuss that as well. And I know there was some uh, questions about how we can perhaps expound upon that, make that a little bit more uh, working in relationship for the greater good of uh, both parties. And we have come back, the city's attorney's office has come back with a uh, proposal that instead of a lease, that there could be an agreement of conveyance if this was something you were interested in. And this is, this would be to convey the property uh, to the historic trust without uh, consideration, uh, provided that they move forward with their mission and uh, development plans to uh, not only use the property as they intended, but uh, to explore other uses that would be complementary not only to their mission, but also the park area itself. And therefore, what you have before you is a, a, a proposal or a draft agreement, I should say, to uh, convey as is a, the two-acre portion of the property located at 632 Hales Chapel Road, excluding the 51.93 acres, which is converted for use as a future park. Uh, what is being proposed, this includes the historic 1841 farmhouse for use as a home for the Boone's Creek Historical Trust, which I mentioned is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. 
also subject to written approval by the city, the trust will have the opportunity to temporarily or periodically utilize adjacent city property beyond the two acres with the opportunity to lease adjacent city property for future programming and development. We did note that should the trust dissolve, change its mission, or decide to lease or sell the property conveyed, which certainly we don't expect, but you don't know sometimes uh, situations that occur, uh, the city would reserve the right to reacquire the property, historic home, and any improvements without consideration of fees or other costs. We also uh, proposed in this document that the city would be authorized to have an easement or right of entry across this conveyed property to access as necessary the balance of the 51.93 acres of property commonly known as the Kefauver Farm. So um, this is uh, come out of discussions with you and, and uh, the city attorney has drafted this document. She did tell me, she's not here tonight, but she did tell me if, that if this is something that you would want to advance or move forward on, the, the disposal of city property, whether it's by conveyance or sale, uh, still would require three readings of an ordinance, and that is consistent with every other property we've ever dealt with in the city. So that would not be different in this case as well. But uh, uh, I have been in contact with representatives of the historic trust, and uh, certainly they are here tonight. If you have any questions for them, I would uh, recommend uh, certainly either uh, you know, moving forward with this agreement of conveyance and, and or seek direction from you as to other avenues that may be satisfactory. Mr. Stahl, um, exactly what are the physical properties that are on the two acres that we would be conveying? Basically, the two acres goes, it encompasses the historic home uh, where you, we place the historic marker. And to the left of the historic home, it basically, uh, the, the grounds right to the, the, almost the front door of the barn. It does not include the barn itself. That would be on our property and that if, if this was entered into and this property was conveyed, the two acres, there would still be an opportunity for the historic trust to come back forward and, and lease or use. If there was a temporary use, we certainly, I think, would be receptive, uh, just like we do with uh, uh, our park system. We have facility use agreements. If somebody want to use a, a particular area temporarily, we, we enter into agreements like that all the time. If they wanted to pursue something more, such as the development of the barn, then that would require the lease that uh, they originally uh, came to us on along with the house. Would we have to wait until we hear about our park transfer to Wing Deer before we could do a whole lot with that barn? Well, I think, I think Mr. Pearson and I talked about that. I think the key is it is property that is subject to conversion, um, but Again, the barn itself, as it stands now, it, while it's on that protected parcel of property, I think we acknowledge that if this moves forward as a park, um, even with the restrictions on there, uh, in my judgment, this would be complementary to the outdoor recreation component because uh, it is a it is certainly a uh, different type of uh, venue, uh, but at the same time. You know, let's face it, we have amphitheaters in our park system right now. now there may not be enclosed amphitheaters, but they're outdoor amphitheaters nonetheless, or music, and, and uh, we, have, we have had times where we've leased the park for certain uh, uh, displays. Uh, we, so, ha we had... Uh, so there would no, be no restrictions on them using it. We wouldn't have to wait to hear from the National Park Service. Not in my judgment. Okay. This could be a long yeah, time. I know. That's yeah. why I didn't want to do yeah. this. Yeah. 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 Could you d is explain why you, we couldn't just convey both the house and the barn? Yes, let me explain that. And, and basically, Commissioner Fowler just touched on that. When we purchased the property from the Kefauver family, in the, about nearly 11 years ago. Um, we purchased it outright, and within four years, we were, you know, and a lot of folks, let me explain this. So we took some federal money for our park system 30 years ago, and um, it applied to various. Wasn't it longer than that? <laughs> it, 50 years 1985, ago. I'm going to say. Oh, it's, uh, and, well, this, right. partic this particular round, oh, okay? okay. And, and in condition for taking this money, and it went, applied to certain parks. One of them was Optimus Park, which is 14.9 acres. Uh, we were restricted from selling 
or disposing of that property without having the opportunity to find property of equal or greater value. Acreage was not so much an issue, but you had to find property of greater or equal value and have um, outdoor recreation as a component of that. So back in 2013, this the commission before you authorized a letter to the state that the conversion of Optimus Park be moved to the Kefauver farm property. And we had, that's nearly 55 acres. It's, uh, it was appraised at equal or greater value that op, as Optimus Park. And therefore, it took four and a half years to do it, but the federal government finally moved uh, and approved the conversion, which basically moved the restrictions for outdoor recreation from Optimus Park to the Kefauver farm. So it, it was in place as of December 2017. Okay, so it's now in place. We cannot sell or dispose of, convey the property in whole or in part of that restricted property unless it's approved by the federal government. So that's why we cannot sell that property as well. Charlie, may I interrupt? You may. Explain to them what is not a part of the conversion. What is not a part of the conversion is, is the, the two, two acres. acres that the house sits on. Right. We purposefully carved that out right. when the conversion went through. That's the reason we can transfer the two acres. We can't do the rest. But, but the rest of it can be used by other parties. It can be programmed by us. It can be leased out like we do other parks for different various purposes. Uh, it really doesn't restrict uh, the property use as long as it is used for uh, recreation, entertainment, tourism, those types of things. I have one more question. I know the, some of the Kefauver family is here. Is this okay with y'all for us, the city, to give this to the Boone's Creek Trust? I'm part of the trust, but not the family. And then behind you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. All of you. Yes. Okay. All right. Just didn't want to do something y'all didn't want us to do either. So, so, Mr. Stahl, what we would we be doing tonight is to vote on our intent to move forward, which would require then three readings. Three readings. Unless we were approving the lease, is that that's right? The lease, I think. Well, the lease wouldn't have three. No, readings. you you no. don't need three readings. All you're approving, what you have before you tonight, is a, an agreement that would authorize us to transfer the property. Right. To the Boone's Creek Historical Trust, it takes one reading and we're done. And on a lease? No, no. no. The what what is before you tonight contemplates a donation. This is not a lease. There was conversation at our workshop about would it be in both parties' better interest to make a donation versus having a long-term, very low revenue-generating lease. And so that we, was the didn't approach. You just say three you just said That's so my understanding. Said the attorney said it, you approve this, and then you draft the ordinance for uh, can officially uh, disposing of the property or conveying it. Okay, I stand corrected. I'm sorry. That's, that's what I yeah. thought. Yes. Yeah, so if you approve this tonight, the, and, and, and the mayor signs this document, uh, Lily Hensley, if, if the trust accepts the document, they would sign it, and then it would put in motion the drafting of an ordinance to officially make the donation, transfer, conveyance, if you will, possible. And I, I guess I would ask the same question of the trust. Is it equally, are either scenario equally appealing? The Why don't we have someone from the yeah, trust come on up? I'm, I was going to let some public input anyway. That's, Ms. why don't you, everybody knows you, go ahead and state your name. I'm, I'm Susan Reed. I'm here on behalf of the trust. Um, we had some conversation with Mr. Stahl and um, he said that there was a possibility of the gifting and so um, our president and I did a voice phone call vote and our trust would be delighted with the gift mm -hmm. of the of the two acres in the house. And and Mr. Reed, why don't you just tell us in the public the use of the house what would y'all do with the house? Um, the, the house will be the museum and offices for the trust. Um, the trust has been around since 1986. It was a byproduct of um, Governor Alexander's homecoming 86 efforts. Um, we have been looking for a permanent home. We've been hoping that it will be the keep offer house and, and farm. 
So we're absolutely delighted to be to this point. Um, the house will be used um, for offices, for the museum. We hope to use the barn at, for the Opry. Um, hope to eventually be able to, to build a building. We've applied to the Appalachian Regional Commission for $500,000. Um, Senator Rusty Crow is asking the governor to put $500,000 in this year's budget for us. Um, we have another lead on another $100,000. we have been very happy with um, some fundraising we've done lately, so we're, we're well on our way and feel very positive about things. But we're going to be doing lots of exciting things we, we plan. Um, you know, we have the, the Opry every Saturday night, and by the way, it's acoustic music, so it, it will be calm and quiet. Um, we're very sensitive to neighbors. We know we're close to a neighborhood out there, so we're very sensitive to that. Um, but we'll have, we'll have um, classes for music, um, gourd preparation. Um, we have quite the artist in our, in our trust in Vicki Shell. So um, we have lots of wonderful things planned for the, the and, farm. And the artifacts that are in the uh, possession of the historical trust, they are significant, aren't they? Yes, they are. We have some in storage and we have some at our current temporary location on Oakland Avenue. Okay. Very good. And the public needs to be able to see all that. Yes, sure. and we are so excited. Right. Any other questions, Ms. Reed? Okay. Go ahead. I, I would like to say thank you to um, Mr. Peterson and Mr. Stahl and to you, Mayor. You all have been so very helpful and we appreciate it very much. Is there anyone else here who would like to um, speak to the Commission? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Reed. Thank you. All right, is there a motion? Yes, I would move we approve the sale of the proper, the transfer conveyance. of the property, yeah. conveyance of the property. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any other comments? Ms. Jennings. Commissioner Calhoun. Yes. Commissioner Fowler. Yes. Commissioner Hunter. Yes. House Mayor Wise. Glad to finally vote on it, yes. <laughs> Mayor Brock. And I'm glad I'm the last vote. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. And we'll get this through on three readings. It'll take about six weeks then to get this through. On second reading, there will be public input again. So there'll be plenty but of But you'll be further up in the agenda, so you won't have to sit through the whole meeting. It gets better the longer you're on the agenda. We might want to sit through. I was thinking somebody would whip out their mandolin back there yeah. or something. Yeah. Very good. Thank you all so much. Okay. Public input is the next item on your agenda. Okay. We will let them clear the chambers here real quickly. I don't, we didn't have anyone who uh, submitted a request for public input. If, if there's anyone here who would like to address the commission, if you would come forward, please. Okay. I will close the public input. That's yet. the end of your agenda. All right. Commissioners, any uh, final remarks? Great game last night for the Bucks. Oh. Way to go. Oh, come on, come here, sir. It was come better. On. Great. Golly. <laughs> Sell out crowd. It's freedom. 6,100 people screaming loud, and it was as good a basketball game as a bunch as of horse people did that. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I think what's important to note, Dr. Sander made a comment, a very kind <laughs> comment, uh, giving some Dr. credit Sanders to our um, city manager. Uh huh about uh, having something to do with that atmosphere last night. Freedom yeah. Hall's renovation. Thank Freedom you Hall's for renovation. getting that so going. You and all wrote the check. It wasn't me. Uh, That's great what Y'all made a great <laughs> event. <so. laughs> great place me for too. them to play. Great atmosphere for the games, and they appreciated that coming from the city. He specifically so. mentioned the cup holders, too, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> and the padded seats. <laughs> did, he miss, did he mention Jeff? No. Just. <laughs> well, it's going to be, um, you know, when our uh, students are over in their new space, which is going to be great, and uh, that provides some additional opportunities at Freedom Hall, so that's good. It, that, that was a great justification for a great reinvestment, and everybody won in that deal. That was, that was a great move by the City Commission. That was, that was wonderful. Mr. Hunter, anything to add tonight? Uh, not tonight. Mr. Fowler. Uh, Science Hills teams will be back in action for basketball here coming up. They both won the conference and they're 
hopefully going on from there. So we'll keep following. It's a Cherokee High School, so it's a long way to wait tomorrow. But uh, they play tomorrow, both teams back to back. Tomorrow, 4 o'clock till probably 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Vice Mayor? You need to run to Kroger to get bread and milk for milk sandwiches. <laughs> so, and, uh, I need some milk on the way. Yeah. Right. Sir? One, one other thing. The Liberty Bell girls' eighth grade team just won the state Champions. basketball championship Overall. last week. Really? And uh, I'm going to see if we can get them down here Please for do. recognition Absolutely. at your next meeting. Yes. Good. Congratulations to eighth grade a team. group of young ladies that play some really good basketball. The yeah. success well of Science Hill Science girls' is basketball bright. is bright. Yes. Yes. Very good. We have uh, the Employee Service Awards coming up. Do you have the date on that? Early March. It's on March. Our calendar. Couple of weeks. March the fourth or something. Okay. I apologize for not knowing, but That's our, we, we probably have it on our calendar. You do. Okay. All right. It's the twelfth of March. Twelfth Thursday, 12th. March twelfth. Okay. If there's nothing else, the meeting is adjourned.